Hope everyone's having a, a good night today, tonight. Um, my name's Steve Scott, and I work for the Regional Sand Bufferlands. I know a lot of you, most of you actually, so thanks for, for coming tonight. Hopefully, um, I'll be able to, to keep you here for a few minutes, although um, the first part of the talk might be a little dry for some of you. So um, if you want to come back in at the really interesting part, you might want to wait about 10 or 15 minutes. So this is a uh, fish night at the Bufferlands. We're going to start with a um, a little bit of uh, kind of geologic history. We're going to go over about 50 million years of geologic history, which kind of uh, started the wheels turning on California fish evolution. But uh, since I don't really know that much about geology, it's only going to take about five minutes. So you can come back into the meeting right now if you haven't left already. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to know kind of uh, where where we started to uh, get to the ultimate fish fauna that we have in California. Then we're gonna talk about um, some of the specific conditions in California that led to some common characteristics of, of California natives. And um, there's several different characteristics that that uh, are, are pretty common to several species in California that uh, allow them to kind of live in the environment that is California today and has been for several thousands and thousands of years. We're going to talk a little bit about some past and continuing threats to native species. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, there, there are a lot of problems with our native fish communities. Um, a lot of them are related to you know, water management and invasive species, and we'll get into that a little bit. And then uh, before, we're going to go into uh, some of the common fish species that we have on the buffer lands that um, you guys all know and love the buffer lands probably. And, and so uh, you, you, you don't always get to see what's underwater. And so we're gonna talk about some of the species we have at the buffer lands and we'll have some pictures of them. But before we get into that, I'll just do a really brief talk on, on fish anatomy, just so we are all on the same page for that. And then, like I said, we'll talk about some of the local fish families and, and some of the more common species we have. We're, we're not gonna get through everything. <clears throat> all right. so. Like I said, I was going to take us back about 50 million years, and what we have here is a is a graphic that I took from an Earth Magazine article um, talking about the Paleo Bell River. So way back then, um, 50 million years before present, the North American content, con continent was a lot like the South American continent in, in the fact that it um, had really high high ground in the west and everything drained off to the east into the Atlantic Ocean. So if you think of what is now South America, you have the Amazon basin basically draining that almost the entire continent um, into the Atlantic. Well, we had our own Amazon back then and it was actually larger than, than the Amazon basin is currently. Um, if you look down here in kind of, you know, the, the Great Basin area now, this, this red area where I'm moving the cursor around, that's kind of the beginnings of of what eventually turned into the Colorado River. And you can see it kind of meandered south, and then it turned up north, headed out to the, to the northeast, um, and then kind of went through the Hudson Bay and ended up exiting somewhere in the Labrador Sea. And, um, you know, that's a huge, huge watershed. Um, but the importance of it to the California fish communities is kind of, if you go back to uh, this point in time, you know, we had a little bit of connectivity with the East Coast. And so we have some, you know, our roots of California fish communities are the same roots that are shared with Eastern North America. And that's where we have some similarities with those fish communities. But then the amount of time that we've been isolated um, have kind of led to a lot of differences. And so a lot of uh, things that happened in the intervening time between when this graphic was taken and what we have today, um, you know, the Colorado or the, the Rocky Mountains began to uplift and started to change drainage pat patterns. The Sierra started to uplift, as well as a lot of uh, volcanic activity, uh, mostly associated with like the Yellow Yellowstone hotspot, um, moved a lot of the rivers around um, and sent a lot of them back towards the West Coast. So this is a, another graphic, just kind of talking about the same things. It's, it's probably kind of hard to see on a similar screen, so I'm not gonna go over it too, too um, closely, but basically, if you look here in this box, about 75 million years ago, it's it's like I was just uh, talking about. Everything was kind of draining off um, to the east, 
And then again, still up until 60 million years ago, some of the further south drainages are starting to drain towards the Pacific side, but still most everything is headed towards the interior of the continent. And then between you know 50 and, and 30 million years ago on those two graphics, um, you know, we had a lot of mountain building and um, tectonic activity as well as volcanism that started shifting some of the rivers to the west as well as making some areas uh, more landlocked. And by about 15 million years ago, um, the Sierra were pretty well formed, although they, they wouldn't reach their full height still for, for longer. In fact, they're still growing to this day. Um, but probably sometime between 10 and 17 million years ago um, was when the California fish fauna um, was isolated, at least the Sacramento watershed fish fauna was isolated from basically everywhere else, including other Pacific watersheds other than species that could um, disperse through the, through the ocean, like anadromous fishes and things like that. But all the freshwater fish were, the ancestors to what we have today were in place probably it's between 10 and 17 million years ago. So here's just one, um, one last graphic to kind of to talk about that a little bit. If you see the red line on the left, so that's that's basically when when it was one common Atlantic drainage, and you can see somewhere it's not really ironed down for sure, but somewhere um, after you know before 40 million years ago is when some of these activities started isolating some of the rivers. Um, this green one over here is when the Sacramento River watershed kind of became isolated, and they have it around 10 million years here, and and um, you know it's not something that happens all at in one event or all at one time. So it's kind of a gradual process that, that happens over millions of years. But this is this is kind of the path after, after we diverted away from the Atlantic drainage to the Pacific drainage. And you can see the Columbia comes off here a long time ago. Um, some of the Colorado Plateau, the Rio Grande, um, uh, more of Columbia being disjointed. And then uh, ultimately the Sacramento finally gets separated um from the rest of the main stem and from that um the evolution of california fi fishes is that's where we're going to be starting from this point so basically all these events that had happened in the past we had a whole you know when we we're this huge um amazon-esque basin in the northern hemisphere um there was a huge fish community that that existed and and all these different events you know a mountain building here uh a volcano uh, eruption here that maybe separates uh, a drainage from another drainage, a drought there that separates them more, a wet thing that reconnects drainages. You have all these fish species, but all those events, they, they can take away some of the potential fish species that we end up with. And so kind of the net result of all these activities is we're driving uh, the, the ultimate California fish fauna into smaller and smaller uh, potential community of fish species. And that's reflected today in, in the fact that we really don't have um, a huge fish fauna for, for the size um, of our state. So this graphic here, this is um, from the Pleistocene. So this is after um, California has probably been isolated hydrologically from the rest of the Great Basin and all that. But I wanted to show it just to kind of illustrate some of the stark differences that we have today from what California fish were evolving under way back then. So all these dark blue areas are basically these large inland lakes that that uh, were trapped there. And anybody who has been in any of these areas of Nevada and Utah now know that we have become much more arid over the over the thousands and thousands of years. And so you know, for a fish, you can imagine that could be pretty tough. Um, fish obviously need water to live. And so with these lakes drying, they become more alkaline, conditions get tougher, probably dissolved oxygen levels go down. Um, also, there's less connectivity between different habitats. So there's more of a chance for small populations to blink out or things like that. So um, just kind of illustrate how different conditions are today from um, when we were back even even thousands of years ago, not even uh, millions of years ago. And then one last graphic, this will wrap up the, 
the geology portion for, for people who are ready to wake up from their nap now. So this is a map of, the, as it says, the late Pleistocene map of California. I stole this from Geology Cafe, which, um, by the way, is a, a really excellent uh, website with a lot of California geology information. And this is kind of a reconstruction of what California probably looked like about 18,000 years ago. Um, you can see at this point the uh, San Joaquin River drainage is connected up to the Sacramento River drainage and goes out through the delta. A little bit before that, the all the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley, it used to drain kind of through here by where Paso Robles is now, and it kind of went down what's the Salinas River Basin now out into the Monterey Bay. Um, but the San Andreas Fault and, and different uh, things like that ended up shutting all this water to the north and to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta that we have today. Additionally, this, this white area is, is uh, glaciated areas. So in the Pleistocene, there were several different gl glaciation events. Um, and you can imagine uh, large sheets of ice in the high country of the Sierra probably don't lend themselves to sustainable fish populations. And um, so any fish that were in those areas during the ice ages were, were basically eliminated from, from contention at that point. And then in, with the combination of the Sierra uplift, a lot of these rivers became impassable for fish into the high country. So historically, I know everybody loves to go up to the Sierra and go, go fishing for trout and things like that. But historically in California, before European settlers arrived, this, this was all a big fishless area, except for a few, few spots where, where there were some fish species either coming from the Lahontan drainage on the west slope of the Sierra, or a few uh, rivers and, and watersheds that were able to um, cross over or have connectivity, connectivity uh, you know, to, the, to the peak of the Sierra. The other thing that the, the glaciers do when we have periods of extension glaciation is if you look at this area, if it's light green off the west of what is currently California, that's a new coastal plain that's been exposed by the sea level dropping. Um, here it says 120 meters, so 400 feet or so. And when this happens several different times over history, you have different things where these rivers will reconnect maybe on the coastal plain. And so you might have uh, fish from one watershed able to move into a different watershed at that time. Um, or they may stay separately and, and, and never reconnect again. And so then you, you have these fish that go on these um, divergent evolutionary paths from that point. So just a lot of different things have happened uh, geologically in California to drive fish evolution. But in addition to that, <clears throat> there's been, there, California in general these days is a tough place to be a fish. If you think about our climate here, we have, you know, we're in a Mediterranean climate. So it's it's either boom or bust. We have, you know, a, a rainy season and then we have a dry season. Um, in the rainy season, there's usually lots of water everywhere. Um, often we get snow melt and you can have huge floods. You know, in historically the Yolo Basin would probably have flooded most years and you'd have the kind of a huge, huge inland freshwater sea there where uh, fish could breed and live and and, and thrive. Um, but then we'd also have these, these drought periods in the summer where these rivers would often go down to trickles and they still do to this day. You know, if you go into to some of the rivers up in the mid to high elevation Sierra in the summer, they're, they're sometimes isolated pools. They can get pretty warm um, when the, the rock in those canyons warms up from the sun and things like that. So not only can it be a boom and bust cycle um, on a yearly basis or even during a year, but um, Long term, there's been numerous periods of, of extreme drought as well as periods of wetter conditions. So um, these drought periods, you can have um, you know streams drying up or becoming disconnected from other streams and things like that. And so that further isolates species and that can lead to speciation. Or if you have streams that completely dry up, that could lead to extinction extinctions as well. And then coupled with that, we still have geological processes going on. You know, we have pretty active volcanic, recent volcanic activity, you know, in, in Lassen and things like that. Um, and then as well as earthquakes and things like that can, can cause rock slides and dam up rivers and, and, and uh, really um, is a lot to deal with if you're a fish that's, that's uh, constrained to a certain body of water. So 
a lot of California fishes um, have some traits in common um, that we're going to talk about right now that help them deal with these conditions. Uh, one of the main things is that uh, a lot of California fish have large body size, they live for quite a while, and they have a really high reproductive rate. So the key here is that you have these fish that can make it through several years, and they have a large body size, and by breeding a bunch every year or when conditions are good, you have a chance that at some point in their life they're going to be able to um, continue on the generations. Um, whereas if you were a small fish and you had a low reproductive rate and you didn't live very long, you may completely miss uh, appropriate windows to breed in. Most California fish exhibit little parental care. So um, in California, we happen to have a, a huge diversity of, of minnows and suckers. Um, and they're, they're just two examples I picked. Um, anadromous fishes also follow this. They basically come up they spawn, they're, they're broadcast spawners, or they lay their eggs in gravel beds. And then in the case of some anadromous fish, they either die. Um, some anadromous fish go back out to the ocean. And then um, in the case of like the minnows and suckers and other freshwater fish, they're just broadcast spawners. They spawn, their eggs stick to the vegetation, and then they're out and, and the, the young are left to fend on their, on their own. They also have a lot of, uh, of um, adaptations that allow them to survive or avoid extreme conditions. So um, a lot of the California fish are, are really plastic in the environments they're able to adapt to and live in. Um, they can survive really high uh, water temperatures, really low dissolved oxygen levels that would kill a lot of other fish. Um, they're also able to, to move to different areas. Um, another technique is to avoid extreme conditions. So Things like anadromous fishes, you know, we have, for example, uh, steelhead trout that come up to the rivers and spawn and go back to the ocean. They, they come up when they can survive in the rivers, they lay their eggs, and then they're back out to the ocean where they don't have to worry about is there going to be a drought or is the water going to get too warm for me to live. And then almost all species in California spawn in the spring um, unless they're taking advantage of special conditions. And one, one specific example that comes to the top of my head is the winter run Chinook salmon, which is only, only found in California this winter run. And it was almost, um, it almost went extinct during the construction of Shasta Dam because the winter run Chinook salmon, what it does is it, it comes up the river in the winter when it, if the conditions are good and the water for it to live, but it goes up, it just goes up into the other upper Sacramento river area um, especially like the Upper Sacramento and the McLeod River. And these rivers have, because of their, you know, volcanic um, origins of in being uh, originating in volcanic areas, there's a lot of uh, natural springs, the water percolates through uh, the lava. And so there's these cold water springs that um, last throughout the year. And so they go up there in the winter when they can make it, they spawn, and then their, their progeny live up there for a year or so. And then they come out um, when conditions are good and go back out to the ocean. But um, the, during the construction of Shasta Dam, um, that basically cut them off from all of their spawning grounds. But because the water releases from the dam are the cold water from the bottom of the lake, they are able to still um, spawn below the dam, although it's a much more restricted area and, and uh, they're, they're not really in what we'd call good shape as a population. And then I, I've kind of touched on a little bit, but in, in California, at least historically, where they haven't gone extinct, in all drainages that connect to the ocean, anadromous fishes are important. Things like uh, salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, um, and then several species of, of, uh, of lamprey and things like that. And one other trait that they all that a lot of them have is they're good dispersers. So you know, we've talked a lot about these rivers that, that dry up to pools or um, they completely dry up. And when they when water comes back again, they often have good habitat for the fish. Um, a lot of fish in eastern North America where the water is uh, more dependable, they may have really small home ranges and never leave areas of, of just hundreds of square feet. Whereas a lot of our native fish, they're designed for to get out of these areas when the conditions are bad. 
But as soon as the water comes back, they can really disperse and get up into these new habitats and, and exploit them and uh, carry out their life cycle. And then the last thing, um, you know, I, I talked a little bit, I think in California, we have somewhere in the mid 60s for the number of freshwater species of fish, which is really not very high. And that's that's shown in uh, local drainages um, have very low levels of species richness. So they'll have uh, a lot of drainages will only have one to maybe seven native native species. Um, because we started with fewer fish, the ones that we have were able to to you know radiate out into the, the different habitat niches, but there wasn't a, a huge base of fish to start with to, to start that radiation. Um, but even though the local species riches, richness is low, um, they, we still have a good degree of morphologically the morphological diversity. So we, in, in several of our uh, watersheds, and I'll use minnows again for an example, we have minnows that have radiated to be basically all different parts of the, the food web. We have small minnows that, that are, you know, the small planktivores, and, and uh, those feed up the food chain to all the way up to kind of our Central Valley um, uh, top of the food chain predator, the Sacramento pike minnow, which is uh, it's still a minnow, but it is a predatory fish and it, it, and it relies almost entirely on eating other fish. So even though we don't have too many species, they have adapted to still fill all the same niches that we, you would find in a stream in Eastern North America. In, in Eastern North America, though, you might have, you know, five or six different species in a stream that all feel kind of a really similar niche. Um, and some of their local streams, uh, they might have 25 to 30 fish species in the community versus the one to seven that we have here. All right, so that's kind of uh, the history of California fish evolution in a nutshell before European settlers came to California. As we probably all know, in uh, mid 1800s, we had a, a gold rush here. And from then things started changing drastically for our fish communities. Um, two probably primary causes in my mind for, for a lot of the changes to uh, the fish communities. Um, the first major kind of set of these are habitat alterations. Kind of something that I, I'll, I'll put into the three Ds. We have dams, diversions, and degradation. So Dams have uh, several different effects that they can do. We, we already talked a little bit about uh, dams cutting um, anadromous fish off from their, their spawning grounds. So that's one really major um, obstacle that they create. Um, most of the time, fish ladders don't work that great um, at getting fish beyond the fish dams, uh, beyond the dams. Um, in addition, they're turning a stream into a lake. And so a lot of these fish are adapted to the river or stream that they were in. and they really can't um, survive in a lake. They're not, they're not adapted to it. So you take out a lot of the habitat that they've been adapting to for millions of years. And then in addition, um, just the degradation, things like logging and grazing and, and farming sends a lot of sediment into the water, um, channelization, um, you know, things like that really degrade the habitat and, and take it away from what it was and what these fish evolved from. And then I, I skipped it accidentally, the, the diversion. So, you know, we, the water in California falls not really in an ideal way for human existence patterns that we have here in California. So as a result, a lot of the water that falls in the northern half of the state gets sent to the southern half of the state. And so you have pumping stations and canals that um, not only kill fish and train fish, take water away from fish populations that might need it, but you also are sending a lot of fish through these canals into different habitats where um, the other fish haven't had to deal with them. And so they can create quite a, quite um, di a difficulties for the fish that are native to those areas. And then probably one of the at least as big as habitat alterations is, is all the introductions of fish species. Um, I mentioned we have about 65 or so native fish species. Well, we have a, about the same number of um, alien fish species that have been introduced here. Uh, and they run the gamut of authorized introductions by, um, you know, state agencies to unauthorized in, uh, introductions by anglers or hobbyists to accidental, accidental introductions, things that were maybe brought over in a different 
um, what they thought was a different load of fish or um, things that escaped from aquariums and, and things like that. So um, these fish put a ton of pressure on our native fish, especially when they're coupled with these habitat alterations. One thing they found is that in streams that haven't been highly altered um, by human activity is that often the native species are able to uh, persist a lot better than in these, these uh, altered habitats. All right, so we're just about to get to some of the uh, fish that we have at the bufferlands, but I just wanted to cover a, a little bit of fish anatomy and mostly just the fin anatomy since that's kind of the I think we all know what the, the mouth and the gills and things like that are. So um, first we're gonna start with the dorsal fin, which I'm sure you guys all know, but if you look at the top fish, it's a cutthroat trout in the Salmonidae family. Um, it has a what they call a soft rayed dorsal fin. So it's soft, it doesn't have any spines or anything like that. Whereas the fish on the bottom is a sacramental perch, which is a centrarchid or the sunfish and bass family. And you can see it has, um, it has what they call a combined spiny and soft rayed dorsal fin. Um, and so it has in the front of the fin, it has these spines that it can raise or lower. I'll have some, I have some pictures of, of a largemouth bass with all these spines lowered and just the rayed portion of the fin is really visible. Um, but that's just one way to tell uh, a centrarchid from some of the other fish. And then some fish families have a, what they call an adipose fin. The salmonids have them uh, as well as the the bullhead catfish or the ictaluridae, they have an adipose fin also. So that's another clue to maybe the family that you might be looking at if you have a fish, you don't know what it is. And then the caudal fin, or as most people know it, the tail. And then the, the last three fins that are kind of at the bottom edge of the fish are kind of laid out like you would expect from anatomy of most animals. So the front most fin is called the pectoral fin, you know, associated with your, your uh, pectoral muscles of your chest. Um, on the bottom fin, the centrarchid, you can see the, the next fin, which is the um, pelvic fin, is not too far back from the pectoral fin, although it does originate behind the pectoral fin, but it is usually below it. And in the, the salmon, it is quite a ways behind. And then finally, in the back, we have the anal fin. And again, in the centrarchid, it has a united spiny and soft grade anal fin. All right, so with that, let's, let's get into our first fish family. I can uh, I can sense your excitement through the muted microphones. So our first family, the, and these aren't in uh, taxonomic order or any kind of order that would make sense to uh, most biologists. They're kind of in the order of of how I kind of feel of their importance to California or the fish fauna at the bufferlands. So in California, the minnow family or the Cyprinidae is much different than it is. Um, in the rest of, of the world. It's a, it's a very successful family. In North America, there are uh, uh, 250 species of minnows in North America. But when you think of um, minnows, most people in, uh, think of minnows as small silver fish, bait fish, and some of those things are often true, um, but oftentimes in California, that's not true. Um, because of some accident in our geological history and evolution, uh, for some reason, when you know when our fish fauna were separated from the the rest of North America, um, there were either um, some really successful minnows that had already adapted to some of the conditions that they were starting to experience, um, or they were able to adapt to them and radiate out from there. And so most minnows are small, except in California we have a lot of pretty large minnows. Um, up to the Sacramento pike minnow, which can get to over a meter in length. And um, I think the, the record Sacramento pike minnow is over 30 pounds. So um, not exactly what most people think of when they think of minnows. Minnows have a well-developed sense of hearing. Um, they, along with the ictalurid catfish, the bullhead catfish, they have um, a series of bones that are called Weberian ossicles that connect the swim bladder to the inner ear. And so the swim bladder picks up vibrations in the water and then the bones transmit that to the ear. So they can actually hear pretty well. And actually the, the males, when they're setting up territories in their breeding, they actually do grunt and make vocalizations that, um, I don't know if they help to drive off rival males or what, but they, they do vocalize um, when they're breeding. Um, their skin also has a chemical, uh, what they call a fear substance. 
So minnows are, are typically schooling fish, except in the, like I mentioned in the breeding season, they may not, they may be defending some territory. Um, but when a fish is attacked and their skin is damaged, they release this fear substance and any, any minnows nearby that smell this, they immediately go into hiding. So it's, um, it's a, a pretty good way to protect other members of your species. Another thing about um, minnows that's really interesting to me is, is they don't have any teeth in their jaws. So all the minnows have what they call pharyngeal teeth. And they have teeth that are actually, um, they're located on the last gill raker, the gill, last gill arch in their throat. Um, and they're these teeth. And, and like with most animals, you can tell what minnows eat by what their teeth look like. And I have some pictures of some minnow teeth in, in later on. But um, so, you know, if they're eating a lot of vegetation or if they're kind of omnivorous, they might look like molars or they might be sharp if they, if they need sharp teeth for a certain purpose. And then a few other um, ana anatomical things is most minnows have four tails. They don't have true spines on their fins. We talked about the centrarchids having a united spiny soft ray fins. Um, there are some that have a, a modified ray that really seems like a spine, but you can tell it apart microscopically. And again, no teeth in their jaw. So this is a fish that we have on the buffer lands, and it is the golden shiner. Um, and this is what, this is probably your prototypical minnow for, for most people. Um, they get a little bit bigger than this, maybe maybe five or six inches. They're really silvery and shiny. They're schooling fish. They eat little tiny organisms in the water. Um, you can see there's a, it has the forked tail like I was talking about. And then they also have kind of, a, a lot of minnows have kind of an orangish hue to their fins. Um, not all of them and not all the time, but um, that is can, can be a clue that if you have a kind of a silvery fish with orangish fins, it's a good chance it's in the minnow family. So the golden shiner, you know, it's, it's an alien species, it's not native. Just to kind of back up a hair, we have about 20 species of fish on the buffer lands and um, only two of them are native. So most of these fish we're going to be covering today are non-natives, although in included a few natives uh, species that we don't have on the buffer lands. But this species was planted in California in 1891, and it was planted to be a forage fish for um, bigger fish that people like to fish for, like largemouth bass. So it was fairly localized until about 1955 when uh, California approved its uh, use commercially to be raised and sold as a bait fish. And then from there, it pretty much spread to everywhere in the state. Um, although it doesn't persist everywhere, it is often reintroduced year after year by bait fishermen, either escaped minnows or at the end of the day, fishermen, you know, empty their bait cans into wherever they are. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of native minnow species that could have filled this um, bait fish role to improve fisheries, um, yet we imported uh, a golden shiner. And, and throughout California fish history, um, I think we'll know by the end of this presentation that um, time and time again, we, we pretty much uh, made a lot of bad decisions about fish introductions, to, to put it mildly. Here is yet another uh, bad decision. This is the common carp with uh, one of our other biologists, Roger Jones, holding it. Um, this is actually in the minnow family, and, and probably most people that see carp don't think they're minnows. You wouldn't think it's a minnow unless you knew. Um, and this is actually the same species as the koi. It just hasn't been bred to have all the beautiful colors. You can see this fish has the forked tail. Um, it's kind of got the orange-hued fins as well. It has a, um, kind of a large, large mouth that it, it sucks food up off the bottom or even from the water column and expels, um, sealed out through its, its uh, gills and, and traps the, the food behind. Um, they're, they're super good competitors. They can handle really high oxygen temperatures or high water temperatures and really low dissolved oxygen levels, um, which makes it perfect for all these uh, modified habitats we have here now. You know, all the farm ponds and slow creeks that are fed by urban runoff are really warm and low dissolved oxygen. And it's perfect habitat for these fish. Unfortunately, it comes at the expense of some of our native fish, fish that could live in these areas. Um, they're super fecund. A, a large female carp can, can lay up to 2 million eggs um, and they can get huge. They can get over 50 pounds. Um, these were brought to California in, way back in 1872. Um, 
a lot of fish species started to be, to be brought to California after the Transcontinental Railroad was constructed because it was a lot, it's a lot easier to bring fish from Eastern North America to California on the, on the rail cars. Um, but even though this one was brought over in 1872, this one actually came by boat from Germany. And a, a guy brought over five carp from Germany and started raising them in a, in a farm pond in Sonoma County. Uh, interestingly, the carp had been raised for food um, since probably before Romans, but the Romans definitely raised them for food and as well as a lot of, um, of Asian cultures as well. But he started with these five fish and then started raising them and started selling them as progeny to everywhere, especially throughout the West, but even all across the country. And there was kind of this carp fever because people were touting them as a, a fine food fish and how good they were and how easy they are to raise. And then a lot of people either didn't know how to cook them or didn't like them. I, I've only eaten one in my life and it was okay. It wasn't the greatest or the worst fish I've ever had. But um, they, people soon realized the mistake of this fish. And by um, 1896, uh, just less than 25 years after they were even brought over here with just five fish, um, they ceased stocking them in waters in California. But by then, it, the damage had already been done. And, and now they're found um, throughout California, pretty much. You can find them almost everywhere. So you remember I talked that minnows don't have spines in their fin or true spines. This is actually the front, what you would call a spine if you're a normal person and not a fish biologist. It's the front uh, ray of a carp dorsal fin, and it's been modified to be a spine. And you can see it's really pointy. It's pretty pretty large. This one's probably three inches big, and it's got a serrated edge on it. it makes them really hard to get out of a net if you were catching one sometimes. Um, but also you can see especially a smaller carp, um, a spine like this that they could uh, raise up could, could really help you know, them if they're being predated on or, or things like that from a predator. But again, this is not a spine, it's actually a modified rig. And then as I promised, we have some, some pictures of some carp teeth. So this is just one side. This would be a, a pair of these on the, in the back of a carp's throat that, um, replace basically the last gill arch. And you can see these teeth uh, look like molars. And carp are omnivores, they eat a lot of plant material, but they will eat a lot of uh, animal material as well. Pretty much anything that has any kind of food value that they suck up into their mouth off the bottom, they, they will eat it. And they can use these teeth, um, they can force them up to the top of their mouth and they can grind the food up against the buckle plate that's at the top of their uh, mouth cavity and it can grind the food, it's this, it's this really hard bone and these things fit right up there and grind that food up um, to help them in digestion when it gets into their body uh, later. <clears throat> okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is one of our Bufferlands native fish. It's one of my favorite fish because it is a native and, and we do have it on the Bufferlands and this is the Sacramento blackfish. And this is also a minnow. You see this, the Sacramento blackfish, it has a much uh, smaller, much smaller scales than the carp um, and it has a, a, a rounded tubular body. So if you took this in cross section, it would be almost round. And then uh, at the base of the tail, at the area that we call the caudal peduncle, where the tail attaches to the rest of the body, it's really narrow. And that's kind of a characteristic of this fish. It has a, a, a mouth right at the end called a subterminal mouth. And you can see the fork tail again, although it looks like something happened to the bottom fork of its tail. And again, you can see there's no adipose fin on a minnow. So the Sacramento blackfish, um, it has some characteristics that make it one of the, the only natives that we still have at the Bufferlands. It's actually really well adapted to um, these backwater, kind of slow moving, tur turbid waters that we have on the Bufferlands. Um, and, and that's kind of common in a lot of these lake, lakes in the Delta area. So they're a filter feeder. So they like uh, food and particles that are suspended in the water. Um, what they do is they take water into their mouth when they're cruising along and they have an organ that releases mucus up to the top of their mouth. And as they pump water through their gills, um, it, their gills are specially designed to force the water over this mucus and the, the food particles actually stick to the mucus and then they're able to swallow the mucus and the, and the food whole. Um, so they're not actually filtering it out with gill rakers or anything like that. They're actually trapping it in mucus in their mouth. 
So they they're filter feeders, so they like they don't mind the the not the the tur turbid water that we have, not the clear water. Um, and then additionally, this is one of the species that's really well adapted to um, high water temperatures and very low dissolved oxygen concentrations. So in the lab, these fish can survive um, to over 100 degrees water temperature, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, really high. <laughs> and then um, they they can survive really low dissolved oxygen con concentrations. In fact, this this is supposed to be a fine food fish. I've never eaten it, and they're sold live at um, a lot of uh, fish markets in the Bay Area, and and they'll just have them in in tubs or or, or tanks sometimes with no supplemental oxygen or anything, and that they can last all day in these tubs um, in these very low uh, dissolved oxygen concentration uh, scenarios. So um, a really interesting fish. And again, this is a minnow, and, and like a lot of California minnows, they get pretty big. Um, this one's probably close to max size. They can get uh, a little over half a meter in length and, and around three pounds or so. So um, this is a, a pretty decent specimen, and, and we do find, um, young of these fish, so they're still reproducing in the buffer lands and, and hopefully they'll stick around for a long time. <clears throat> Another native fish, unfortunately, this one's not found on the buffer lands. We don't really have appropriate habitat for it, but it's such a dominant fish in, in the Sacramento watershed and such a cool fish that I, I couldn't leave it out. Um, <clears throat> so this is the Sacramento pike minnow. Um, again, this is, this is a minnow they can get to over a meter long and over 30 pounds. When they're small and young, they eat a lot of invertebrates, um, you know, insect larvae and things like that. But when they get large, uh, they pretty much specialize on fish and they're almost entirely piscivorous. Um, interesting note, I got these, these photos from the UC Davis cowfish website, which is a, another good resource. And this bottom photo, uh, before she became a sanitation district employee, she's she's now I believe our chief scientist. Uh, she was she was a uh, she was studying fish, and so she actually took this bottom uh, photo of a pike minnow. So um, thanks, Lisa, for the photo. And then I talked a little bit. So pike minnow have been kind of maligned. There's several different pike minnow species in different drainages. So the Sacramento pike minnow, you know, is native to our drainage. It has been imported to a couple other drainages, but a lot of other uh, drainages up the coast have their own pike minnow species that are very similar to these. And they're often thought of as trash fish or predators that eat too many salmon and things like that. So a lot of people um, don't like these fish and they'll just try to kill them whenever they catch them. And they, they don't even they don't even want to see a pike minnow. But the thing is, is that's probably a little overblown. overblown. Um, obviously, pike minnow and salmon have evolved over thousands and thousands of years. And so if the pike minnow were gonna eat the salmon out of existence, it would have already happened. Unfortunately, we have you know, reduced salmon populations now because of a lot of the dam activities that we have. And so one place that pike minnow, these Sacramento pike minnow often caused a problem or a perceived problem was um, below Lake Shasta, there was a dam constructed called the Red, Red Bluff Diversion Dam. And when they had that thing closed, all these fish, pike minnow, were also migrating up to spawning grounds, but then also the uh, the salmon were migrating up and they'd be trapped behind this dam. And at these times, the pike minnow could sometimes, you know, prey very heavily on 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 the salmon that were were trying to disperse in, into different habitats. Um, and so someone came up with the idea of setting up a an electroshock system that was rigged to a camera and it would electroshock pike minnows only when they came through this red bluff diversion dam. And so they started doing it and it was working pretty good. It was selectively, they were selectively able to kill pike minnows, but after a few days, no more pike minnows tried to, to come through the diversion dam and through the, the electroshock device. And they, they speculate that the reason that probably was is we talked about the fear substance that minnows have in their in their skin is that the electroshock was damaging their skin and releasing this chemical fear substance and so it was keeping the other pike minnow away from the area and then here these these aren't sacramento pike minnow teeth these are uh teeth from a northern pike minnow but it's the best i could find um and you can see these teeth are 
ideally adapted to once you start swallowing the fish to um, holding them in uh, in your mouth and not letting them escape as well as kind of shredding the fish up as they go down uh, into your stomach to make it a little bit easier to digest. So hopefully uh, you all enjoyed our, our minnow talk and now we're going to move on to the centrarchid family. So the centrarchid family evolved in North America. Um, it's, a, it's a North American family but there are only about 30 species um, and of those 30 species there's only one species that is native to California and it is native to the Sacramento drainage although it's its habitat is is drastically reduced now at this point but um, interestingly it's it's in a completely different genus from all the other centrarchids and there were um, other species of that genus in the fossil record in different watersheds but through uh, the geologic and evolutionary pressures, they only ended up in the Sacramento area. All of these fish species are carnivorous. There's no, no vegetarians involved here. And they're all nest builders. They all build nests and typically defend those nests against um, egg predators, as well as um, try to fight off uh, rival males from, from breeding um, with the females. Like I mentioned, they evolved in North America, and the Sacramento perch is the only California species. Um, we do have a lot of species of centrarchids here now since um, we've we've brought them over and imported them into uh, a lot of our most of our waters and reservoirs. And their anatomy, they have that united spiny and soft red dorsal fin that, that I've mentioned a couple times. That's a that's a good way to tell that you have a centrarchid. Probably one of the most uh, popular game fish we have is the largemouth bass, and this is this is a huge centrarchid. Um, they can get, I think, the California angling record is around 22 pounds or so. Um, this is the photo I mentioned earlier. This front part of the fin, you can barely see it. It's actually put down uh, against its body. That's the spiny portion, and they can actually raise and lower those spines. And then the back, that's the uh, that's the soft raid portion of the dorsal fin. Um, Largemouth bass are, are predatory fish. You know they're carnivorous, like all all the other centrarchids, nest builders. And unfortunately, they're they've spread everywhere. And even fairly recently, they've made it into Lake Tahoe. Um, they typically prefer warmer waters, but they've been able to survive in areas like the Tahoe Keys and and some of the areas that are shallower and maybe get some more sunlight and able to stay um, a little bit warmer than the rest of Lake Tahoe. A couple other fish we have here in the bottom of this tank, we have a, this is a bluegill right here, and then some kind of bullhead, probably a, a black bullhead, I'm guessing. Um, and then I can't tell if that's a, a white catfish or something like that in the back, but uh, just a few other species we have that we'll cover in a little bit. In fact, right now, oh, there's another shot of a, of a largemouth bass with, uh, looks like some minnows in the background. And uh, this fish up here is a, is a crappie. Um, probably a black crappie, and then I can't tell what kind of minnows these are, but likely to be golden shiners. And so the next one is, the next centrarchid we're going to talk about is another introduced species, it's the bluegill. This species has been widely introduced throughout the world. Um, it may have one of the largest distributions of, of any fish, it's hard to say. Um, and it was brought to California in 1908. It's a, a really good sport fish under the right conditions they can get fairly large uh, I think the california record angling record is about three and a half pounds which is a good size fish and they're really delicious uh they're, they're probably the best tasting of the centrarchids um although sacramento perch are actually pretty pretty uh good good tasting as well um, but they were brought in 1908 to california um and within 20 years they were widely distributed throughout the state uh, a lot of that was movement through, you know, waterways and things like that, but then also anglers that wanted them in their own ponds or their own stretch of creek um, would import them to their waters. One of the things about the bluegill that's really interesting is uh, because they're nest builders and like centrar uh, all the centrarchids, um, but the males have three different breeding strategies. So the primary one is you have uh, what they call parental males, and they're usually uh, four to five years old, and they're usually fairly large. And what they do is they build nests and set them up on territories and bluegill kind of nest colonially. So you'll have a bunch of bluegill nests in one area. And these parental males, they'll build this nest and defend it against other males. 
And then when females come through, they try to attract them and then they will um, they'll spawn together and fertilize the eggs in the nest and the male will continue uh, protecting those eggs until, until the fryer leave. But then a couple other strategies, you have satellite males, which are smaller fish and younger. So they get to breed earlier, um, even though they, they don't have the advantages of being large and able to defend a, a territory, they do get to breed earlier. Um, but these satellite males, they kind of try to disguise themselves as females. And so the other males, the parental males don't run them off. And so what they'll do is they'll kind of be cruising around like people, the other fish will think they're a female. And then when a female comes in to breed with a the male, they'll sneak around to the other side and also release sperm to try to breed with that female at the same time. And then the last um, strategy that they have is what they call sneaker males. And these are also smaller males um, like the satellite males, but they, they, uh, they don't try to, play themselves off as female. And what they'll do is they just uh, kind of run in at any chance they get. A lot of times they'll just be at the outer edges of the colonies because they keep getting run out. And they'll just try to, to dash in at the last minute on the opposite side of the female from the parental male um, and, and fertilize the female's eggs when she releases them. <clears throat> Another fish that we have here, it, it was, uh, Probably an un unfortunate introduction um, for other reasons besides just being a non-native is the green sunfish. It's it's uh, spread throughout the state. It's really competitive, and um, it was brought to California in 1891. But it doesn't get very big here usually, and and uh, it's not really a, a popular game fish. People don't go target these things, and so it's it's. Uh, uh, it, it's another fish that's, that was brought here, um, possibly accidentally, um, but I think to the southern part of the state, it was inten an intentional introduction. And then probably to other parts in the state, it, they were brought in with shipments of bluegill because they, they do look fairly similar. <clears throat> another fish species we have on the buffer lands is the war mouth. Uh, this species, in addition to having teeth in their jaw, they also have teeth on their tongue, which is kind of interesting. Um, they're not very abundant. They're pretty minor fish in, in the California scene. In fact, um, in the, the Delta pumps that pump water into the California aqueduct, they do a lot of studies on the fish that get trapped in and trained there. And I think out of about 250,000 centrarchids that they trapped in this one period, um, I think only about 200 of them were warmouth. So um, not a huge component of, of the uh, California fish seen. Um, and these probably weren't an intentional introduction. They were probably accidental. Uh, the smaller ones, they look like some of the rock bass species that you find in eastern North America and, and which are a little bit better of a game fish. So people probably bought them, brought them over because they thought they were rock bass. And then another fish um, that we have on the buffer lands called the, the black crappie. Um, there's also a white crappie. They're very similar, um, occupy similar niches and, and behave very similarly. Here's a picture of one we got at the Bufferlands. Um, you see it's a pretty large guy. So they have these these papery, um, papery dorsal fins and anal fins that are pretty distinctive along with the, the spiny and soft ray fin. But then this guy here is a pretty nice speci specimen. Um, they can get over four pounds. And you can see with uh, this this biologist's thumb and this guy's mouth, it's, it's got a pretty big mouth. and and it's not even all the way open. If if we were to open this mouth up even further, it could probably fit a fish uh, maybe two or three inches in, in diameter into its mouth and, and be able to eat it. Um, so when these fish are young, they eat a lot of insect larvae and things like that. But when they get to be this size, they almost primarily eat um, other fish. So now is probably a, a good time to mention um, this fish as well as the bluegill um, are speculated to be two of the primary um, causes of the decline of our native centrarchid, the Sacramento perch, which is what we're going to get to. The, the bluegill, um, they're really good nest predators. They'll eat eggs and fry and, and young larvae from, from other centrarchid nests. And then these guys will not only eat young of the year, Sacramento perch and things like that, but they also compete with Sacramento perch for, for the food that the Sacramento perch are eating. So they find when black crappie and bluegill are present, um, it's often not a really good road 
um, for Sacramento perch. In fact, Sacramento perch, here's a picture of one. They're, they're, uh, they're not adapted to living with these other centrarchid nest building fish. You know, all these ones that we've imported come from areas with, with uh, you know, 20, 20 other centrarchid species that they're used to competing with for nest sites and to defend nests. But this was the only game in town centrarchid wise um, before these other ones were brought over. So that's probably one of the things they have against it. Um, and just not being quite as aggressive as some of these fishes that had to be aggressive to um, to live with these other uh, centrarctic species that they evolved with. So the Sacramento perch was native to the Sacramento Valley watershed, but now it's only the only two native populations that remain are one that they think is native on the on the uh, on Alameda Creek, which is the uh, Calaveras Reservoir. And then also there are Sacramento perch that are endemic to Clear Lake as well. Um, interestingly, in Clear Lake, they are able to coexist with some other centrarchids, but they do find when the white when the cropping numbers go down, Sacramento perch numbers seem to go up. And so we're not we're not quite sure why they are able to coexist with with the centrarchids in Clear Lake, but um, they have found a niche that they're able to to persist there. Um, Interestingly, this fish, it's not close to extinction in other parts of the world, although it is in its native range. Um, it has been spread to numerous lakes, especially in the Great Basin region where it's spread to these lakes that can be a little bit alkaline. So these fish can put up with pretty high alkalinity. And um, as long as there's not other centrarchids there, they tend to do pretty well. So they're in uh, Pyramid Lake and and uh, Crowley Lake in the Eastern Sierra, Pleasant Valley Reservoir and Owens River Watershed, things like that. Um, and they, they're doing pretty well in those areas. Um, and interesting, another interesting fact is most of those Sacramento perch were all taken from one pond in the Sacramento area. Um, it used to be called uh, Brickyard Pond and now it's Greenhaven Lake in the Greenhaven area. And it used to be full of Sacramento perch and for years and years they used it um, as kind of rootstock to uh, transplant fish to, to some of these other lakes where they're now found. And, um, but that population has since uh, disappeared. You know, now that area has, um, you know, turned into uh, an urban pond basically in, in, in a housing tract and there's other centrarchids in that pond now and, and now there's no Sacramento perch left. <clears throat> Another fish family, we have a few representatives representatives of on the buffer lands is the ictalurid catfish. So these are the bullhead catfish and these also evolved in North America. Um, there's about 45 species. So we don't have any native ictalurid catfish in California, but there are um, fossil ictalurids in, in on the west coast. And so they probably were here at one point and we're not quite sure why they disappeared because they, they seem to be pretty well adapted to um, to life in California waters. So maybe it was just, you know, kind of one of those uh, sudden extinction events caused by, you know, who knows what that, that led these guys, the, their ancestors to extinction in California. They are related to minnows. And so they have some of the, the same features that minnows have. They have that well-developed sense of hearing and the Weberian ossicles so they can hear. Um, but they're nocturnal and bottom feeders. A lot of them have barbels that they can kind of sense food on the bottom. Um, and they do survive very low dissolved oxygen concentrations as well. And these guys, like I mentioned, they're they're native east of the Rocky, Rockies, um, but they're they're no native species um, west of, of the Rockies. And they have a sheath of skin on spines, so they have spines on their dorsal fin and on their um, two pectoral fins that they can put out and lock. And the sheath of the skin of those spines has a poison. And when a predator gets that or an angler gets stabbed by the, those spines, um, it can be really irritating and, and cause a lot of pain. So um, it's a good uh, mechanism to avoid predation. Oops, wrong button. And then, so they don't have any scales. They have the eight barbels. They do have an adipose fin like the salmonids. Um, and again, those spines I was talking about, again, they're not actually spines, they're modified rays. Um, and then they have hundreds of tiny teeth. So, you know, we talked about the minnows having teeth in their jaw or in their throat. 
some charcas have them in their jaw that are a little bit bigger and sharper, but catfish, the ictalurids tend to have these um, hundreds and hundreds of tiny teeth. And I have a, a couple pictures of that after we go through a few species. Probably the most common ictalurid we have on the bufferlands is the black bullhead, which is a little bit of a misnomer since a lot of times they look really bright yellow like this guy here. Um, it's a, a really pretty fish. Um, uh, they, they have a lot of interesting things. And one of the things that they do is when they have these young, um, they do, they do kind of shepherd their young long. And so you'll see in the springtime in the early summer, these schools of these little tiny catfish moving around and they kind of move around as one unit and they can almost be like a super organism. And then typically the, the parents are somewhere uh, beneath kind of uh, rough, roughly keeping guard over these guys. Um, so I, I didn't mention it earlier, but the, the bullheads, the, the, what we call the bullheads, like the black bullhead, brown bullhead, and yellow bullhead, they have uh, a squared off tail. They don't have a forked tail. So that's one way to tell, tell them apart from two of our other catfish, which are the channel catfish and the white catfish. Um, so these guys can get up to uh, about a half a meter as well and up to eight pounds, although I've never seen one anywhere close to that big on the bufferlands. We have uh, channel catfish on the bufferlands as well, although probably not as common as <clears throat> the white catfish. Um, you'll notice a deeply forked tail. They have an adipose fin. They have spots over their body. The spots are, are one good way to tell them apart from white catfish, but often, especially in some of the larger individuals, um, they won't have any or they'll have very few spots that are easy to miss. So it's not a foolproof way to tell them apart from a white catfish on bufferlands. But oftentimes this anal fin is. You see the anal fin of a white catfish is pretty long, uh, or a channel catfish is pretty long and doesn't come out from the body very far. And I'll show you a white catfish anal fin a little bit later to, to be able to compare them. And channel catfish are pretty, can get really big and long lived. They can be over 50 pounds and they found individuals that are um, about 40 years old and they can get uh, about a meter long or so. And they're really easy to raise in aquaculture situations. So they are one of the most popular aquaculture fish in California. And in 1997, um, the, the channel catfish uh, aquaculture economy added about eight, 11, uh, $11.8 million to the California economy. So not an ins insignificant um, amount of, of economic activity associated with this fish. And then here's a skull of a channel catfish I found a, a month or two ago. Um, it's about seven inches in diameter. It's a little, it's a little bigger front to back and about seven exactly side to side. So the this picture on the left is the top view looking down from the top of the head. And then this is the side view and you can see it's got a really flattened head. Um, I think they, they have a lot of flexibility in their jaws and they're able to um, articulate their jaw in ways that we don't think of being able to do that with your jaw, they have more kind of joints. And so they can open really big and swallow very large prey through that, kind of like a like you think of a snake doing, I guess, but a different mechanism. And then we talked about the catfish having thousands of, uh, or hundreds of tiny, tiny teeth. And, and this is what they look like up close. This is that same skull. So a, a pretty big individual. And all these tiny teeth, which are really good at gripping prey, you know, if they, if they catch a fish or something like that, um, and I imagine they probably have some filtering capability too if they're if they you know expel water out through their mouth. And then the white catfish is a, is another one we have at the bufferlands. Um, this is actually the most important catfish species in the delta as far as um, just recreational anglers go. it's It's the most prevalent. And you can see um, it has the adipose fin, has a forked tail, and then, its anal fin is a lot long. Uh, it's it's not as long in the direction of the fish, but it sticks out further from the body and it's more rounded than the, the channel catfish anal fin. So if you have a channel catfish with no spots, you might be able to tell it apart from that that fin. Um, fish over about four four and a half pounds are pretty uncommon. Um, there is a record of a 22 pound white catfish that was caught in William Land Park, but there's some speculation that maybe it was mis-ID'd as and was actually a channel catfish. So maybe it was one of those channel cats with no spots and they just assumed it was a, a white catfish. 
All right, moving on to our next family is the Poecilidae or the live bearers. This is the, the same family as your aquarium guppies and mollies would be in. Um, it's a pretty successful family. It's, it's kind of uh, centered in that Central America region, um, but there are some native species in North America as well. And there's more than 200 species. It's a pretty successful family. And they bear live young, they don't, they don't lay eggs. Um, and the males have an elongated ray on their anal fin, uh, which is one way to tell, tell a male of, of the species. And here's a, a male and a female. The top fish is a female. You see it has a, typically has a much larger body size when it's full grown. And obviously if you're gonna go through a pregnancy and, and um, birth actual live fish, you're gonna, it's gonna be an advantage to be a little bit larger. And then you can see the, that elongated ray on the, on the anal fin of the male uh, down there. And, and uh, an interesting thing about the mosquito fish is it can actually store sperm from the male for a period of, of time so that if it has eggs or it's already pregnant, it could store sperm and, and fertilize the eggs later when maybe conditions are better for it. Um, these were imported to California for actually another reason that I haven't mentioned yet, and that was for uh, pest control. They were raised because, of, or they were brought here for their voracious appetite and, and eating mosquito larva. Um, they were brought in 1922 from Texas, um, and they're now pretty much uh, throughout California, although they will die off if the water gets too cold. They typically don't live longer than about 15 months max, um, and they're finding that where these fish are, they really do a number on, on tree frog eggs, as well as really small free tree frog tadpoles, and the same with California newts. They're, they're, um, Adult California newts have, have toxins in their skin, but the young aquatic forms and the eggs don't have any toxins to protect them from predation by things like mosquito fish. So they can really do a number on populations of those. I can see I'm a, a little bit over time here, so I'm gonna try to zip through these even faster than I've been going. There's another uh, actual mosquito fish from the bufferlands. We're gonna go into the silver sides of the Atheronopsidae. There's uh, 70 species, but only three in California. And um, one species that we're probably familiar with that is native to California is not a freshwater species, but it's that California grunion is also in this family. They're all surface oriented. Um, most of them are marine. But uh, the species that we have here is the inland silver side, and it, it is a freshwater species that was imported here. But they don't have an adipose fin. They have two widely separated dorsal spins, so it's fins, so it's not that united dorsal fin like you see on the centrarchids. Um, they have one spine on their anal fin and a small terminal mouth. And since they are surface oriented, it's usually up towards the top of their head, so they're they're feeding above it um, using that mouth at the top of their head. And here you can see uh, that mouth is kind of um, upturned right there, and and it, it really is gives you a clue that it's a surface oriented. You can see here, it's got a, a silver stripe and it's where it got its name, the Inland Silver Side. And you can just barely see the front dorsal fin here and the back dorsal fin here. This could raise up and then you'd see it has two distinct dorsal fins. Silver sides were, um, were brought here uh, to help for two, a couple reasons, to help control Clear Lake gnat population, which um, at certain times of the year, the gnats in the Clear Lake area can be really bad and um, also as bait fish for um, some of the larger game, game fish species we have. Unfortunately, their introduction into Clear Lake, Clear Lake um, most likely led to the extinction of the Clear Lake split tail. Um, so there's an almost immediate um, effect right net there of a, a non-native fish introduction. And also it completely changed the fish fauna of Clear Lake in a, in a, a number of years. So it, it didn't take long for this, this uh, species to really change um, the Clear Lake fish fauna. Another family we have is the Sculpin family or Cotidae. Um, we do have one native Sculpin uh, species on the bufferlands, uh, the prickly Sculpin. In fact, all of these species that are in the Sacramento area are, are native to California. And we have eight species. They're all bottom dwellers. They don't have a uh, swim bladder. So um, they don't have to expend any effort to stay on the bottom. And they typically will, you know, flick their, their fins and tail to, to dart up in the, in the water and then just 
go back down to the bottom. Since they are on the bottom, they have a dark mottled coloration to, to hide them from predators. They're typically very small. And they have big fat, uh, flattened heads. They don't have scales and they also have two dorsal fins. And here's a couple of uh, prickly sculpin that we uh, got at the buffer lands. And here's one in his habitat. You can see they're a little prettier when they're, they have all their colors and they're, they're in their natural kind of resting position. You can see the two dorsal fins and they all have these big pectoral fins. And then that, that really large head for the rest of their body compared to the rest of their body. Um, one other family we have on the buffer lands a representative of, of is the herring family or Clupeidae. There are two species that use uh, California fresh waters. One is the American shad, which is a uh, anadromous species that runs up the American River and Sacramento River. And then the other one that we have is the threadfin shad. And I like to think of these guys as kind of the prototypical bait fish. Um, they have a lot of uh, characteristics that evolve to um, kind of protect them from predation. So the American shad from the ocean, they get pretty big, but being in the ocean, they're still a, a bait fish when they're out there. And then the threadfin shad that we have is much smaller in the freshwater that's permanently in the freshwater. And so it's always a bait fish as well. And so they have what they call deciduous scales. So like deciduous leaves on a tree, if something hits a, hits a, uh, a herring family member, it can lose scales. And as they start falling in the water, they kind of shimmer in, in, uh, in the water and distract the predator from where the fish actually is. Kind of like, uh, uh, like fighter, fighter planes that can release the chaff to distract the heat seeking missiles from, from uh, the actual plane. And they also have a, a sharp keel. So their, their body goes from a rounded top down to a sharpened keel. And what that does is it means that any sunlight coming from the top won't cause the bottom, they won't have a shadow on their belly. So they're, they're less visible when you're looking at them from below. They're all planktivores. And so here's a picture of a threadfin shad. They can probably get five or six inches or so. And they have a really long, uh, sometimes you can see it, you can't on really on this guy, a long ray on their dorsal fin. That's, that's where they got their name. And they have this uh, black spot. And then you can, you can kind of see the sharpened keel at the, at the belly of this fish right here. But, so if you're looking up from the bottom of that, you wouldn't be able to see very much because it would hopefully blend in with the sky above. And then our last family that we're gonna go through today is the uh, Persidae, the perches and darters. Um, I know we already talked about the Sacramento perch, but we remember right there in the Centrarchid family. So Sacramento perch is kind of a misnomer. They're, they're actually that could be called the Sacramento sunfish or Sacramento panfish or something like that. So the perches, um, we, we have uh, one member on the buffer lands and there are no native perches uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, they lack a functional air bladder like the sculpin, so they're bottom oriented and they, they, they call them darters because, because of that lack of a, a swim bladder, they, they swim and sink, swim and sink. And so it looks like they're darting. And they also have two widely separated dorsal fins and, and no air bladder. And so this is the big scale log perch. You can see the two dorsal fins here on this guy. Again, like the sculpin, they have the coloration that'll help them blend in with the bottom since that's where they spend most of the time. And this fish was introduced to California in 1954. And we actually have a pretty good idea what happened with this fish. Um, it was not an intentional introduction. It was brought here in a shipment of um, bass and bluegill to Beale Air Force Base to create some fishing opportunities at the Air Force Base. And the ponds that they were put in, um, they were in the shipment with those fish and the ponds they were put in overflow into the Bear River, which in turn overflows into the Yuba River. And so when that happened, um, it didn't take them long and within 15 years, uh, they were spread throughout the, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. So they went from this one pond on Beale Air Force Base to 15 years later being throughout the Delta. And then pretty much any fish that gets into the Delta at some point gets into the California aqueduct through the pumping system and goes much further south into Southern California and to some, some of the lakes that are, that are off the California aqueduct and things like that. Um, so again, this is one that we would call an accidental introduction. 
So that's all the species we're going to cover. Um, a lot of what we've learned at, uh, <clears throat> at the Bufferlands from our fish species we've done through um, sampling with the appropriate permits. And this is a, a large 100-foot seine net that we've used to do sweeps through some of our lakes. Um, this is an example of a cast net um, thrown by the, the best I ever had to uh, the, the privilege of being in a boat with with the cast net, Pete Canella. Um, and he he could throw that net pretty good and get a nice big circle every time. And and uh, we use that to sample a couple times um, to test some of our fish species for uh, heavy metals like mercury. And here's here's some of our crew actually taking some fish samples to see if we had elevated levels of mercury in our water bodies. So for any of you that are that are interested in further information, I can't recommend this book enough. This is by Peter Moyle, who's a professor at UC Davis. There's probably a new edition since this one came out, um, but this is pretty much the, the Bible of California fish. And uh, so that is um, all I got there. So does anyone have any questions? Hey, Steve, so we, we did get a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one of them is that have there been any recent um, introductions of invasive species that we that have caused a major concern? In, in California itself. Um, so I'm probably missing some some low hanging fruit here, but um, some of the ones I think of is is we probably all remember the fairly recent introduction of northern pike into Lake Davis and in, in the Sierra, and all the effort that went into trying to um, to poison all those fish and the damage it did to the local economy because people couldn't obviously fish for trout in those lakes when the northern pike were there. They were concerned that the pike would get into um, the river watersheds and really do a number on the rest of the, the native fish and salmon runs and things like that. Um, we have found um, some other fish that we don't know if they're established yet in California, um, things like uh, bluefin killifish, which have been found in, in some local streams. Um, don't know if they would cause cause any any problems. Um, and then other parts of, of the country, you know, you hear of, of grass carp and uh, snakeheads and things like that. Um, but that's that's the most of the recent ones, unless uh, anyone wants to jog my memory of some other ones that I'm aware of. So one of, thank you. One other question was you had mentioned about our native fish have low parental care, and then some of the other introduced fish, they at least uh, make a nest and maybe they guard the eggs or the baby. So what is the other end of the spectrum relating to ours have low parental care? What what would you consider a species or what does it mean when they have a lot of parental care? Yeah, so, so there's some so a few different strategies. Um, you know, no California fish do this, but but some some fish um, they call them mouth brooders. So they they will actually hold their young in their mouth um, to protect them from predators. Um, to the centrarchus, like we talked about, they'll actually guard their nest until the um, the larvae that hatch out from the eggs leave the nest, so that uh, catfish and things like that can't come into the nest and actually eat the eggs before before the young hatch. Um, things like sculpin, they also will will build a nest and and guard it until the larvae leave. So that's a native fish that does some some nest guarding. So um, they'll build a nest, or, or typically they'll find it under a rock and they'll kind of excavate a little bit. But they actually stick their eggs to the to the roof of the nest cavity. And they will protect them until the, the larvae leave the nest. So in California, that's probably the, the scope of, of uh, parental care. So one other question just came in and it was talking about, I think it was the bluegill where you talked about the males had three reproductive strategies. So the, is that specific to a male for the entire life or is that age specific or size specific? And they eventually they change to the other male that would you know protect and and um, have the nest is how does that work? It's my understanding that the, there there are distinct genetic differences and and they don't change from one to the other. So if you're a parental male uh, at, at, and you have the genetics to become a parental male, you're you're not going to breed at those young ages as a satellite or a sneaker male. 
Um, you're going to put your effort into getting bigger and stronger. And then when you are four to five years old, you will, you will then try to, to defend a territory and build a nest and become that. And so I don't think they turn from one to the other. Okay, thanks. And then would you say one more time, will you give a list of the actual fish that we have on the buffer lands, which are native? So the two species uh, that we're positive we have that are native are the Sacramento blackfish, which is in the minnow family, and then the prickly sculpin, um, which is in the sculpin or cotidae family. It's possible we have other sculpin species that are native. They're very hard to identify, and we actually don't um, come across them that frequently to be able to look at a lot of them. They're, they, they're, they, ev they evade a lot of our uh, sampling techniques because they are bottom oriented. Um, and then it's, it's possible we have a couple other minnows. You know, we've, we've, small minnows are often really difficult to identify. And so we've captured small minnows that we in the past have thought might be hitch, which would be a, a potential minnow in our area. Um, and, and fish fawn has changed greatly from year to year um, based on, on conditions. So um, especially with younger recruitment, you, you might have vastly different communities from year to year. So to really have a great handle on it, we probably need to do um, sampling every year and, and we just don't have the resources to do that. But to those two species, the Sacramento blackfish and prickly sculpin for sure. So you talked about salmonids and um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but we've on the buffer lands, we've only found one. Is that correct? That see, so that happened but before I was working there, and I think that's that's what you told me was that you did find one. Um, so the buffer lands is connected uh, to the delta, um, and, and under certain water conditions, um, th it's really not even that hard to go up the delta. And I actually. So we've we found the sal the the one salmon on the bufferlands, but then um, a few years ago, they found some salmon spawning in Upper Morrison Creek up near Mather Air Force Base, and I'm pretty sure they had to come through the bufferlands to to get up to there. I can't think of any other way for them to get up there. So it's possible that in um, certain years that we do have salmon that come through the bufferlands, although I personally have never seen them. And I think we've only actually had the one specimen. Okay. All right, I think that that's all the questions that we've received on the chat. If anybody has a question, if you will feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. Uh, I see Barry Ray has something. Yeah, I had a, I, I put in a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, could, you may have, you may have thought it was dry, but I thought the geological part was absolutely fascinating. So um, could we get copies of those geological slides? Yeah, Perhaps? so I, I did put um, on, on my presentation, I put where I got them and I, I know Raj recorded this and we will be putting it up on the website. But um, okay. if, if you wanna send um, an email to, to the email that was on the invitation to Roger, uh, he, will, he can forward that to me and then I will, uh, I will give you maybe some copies that might be a little more usable um, that I used and, and even I'll send you some web links to some of that information that might be better for you. Yeah, that to me, that was just, uh, I love that. Well, and, and partly because I was raised in the San Joaquin Valley and you could see where T Tulare Lake was and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and the yeah. other thing I had is, um, could you give us just a concise list of the fish on the buffer lands? Cause I, I tried to capture it as you were talking, but I'm not sure I got the actual correct list. Yeah, so that, that list is actually the, probably the best list we have right now of that is actually available on our website at bufferlands.com. Okay, in, okay. In the, I'll get that. I think there's a list of flora and fauna and there is a fish list. I was looking at it today and it, it looked pretty well updated. So um, okay. if you wanna go there and, or if you have trouble finding that, just uh, again, with that email, just let me know and I'll, I'll send that along as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So, Steve, you had, you had pointed earlier one of those maps. It looked like what you were indicating that is it still true that everything from the grapevine to north of us still comes and goes out through the delta? Is that still true? It, to my knowledge, it's true. And, and even certain times, um, all the way up 
So the Pitt River up in northeastern California connects into the Sacramento River. And at different times, Goose Lake, which is um, uh, a lake that straddles the California-Oregon border in northeastern California, I don't think it's done it for years and years, but at some times it has spilled into the Pitt River, which um, they, it's kind of listed as a closed watershed, but um, those are just, you can think with, with some of the amounts of water that we had, you know, way back when that we were probably connected in with um, a lot of Lake Lahontan at different times when the water level got high. And even different times, the upper Snake River came down through northwestern Nevada and up through southeastern Oregon um, as well. So, uh, but yeah, now um, I'm pretty sure all the, the water in there, if if it drains and if it doesn't get pumped down to Southern California, it goes out through the Delta. At, at one point before we started doing water diversions, um, I think 50% of all um, uh, water that left California went through the Delta. Okay, so uh, one last question. I just wanted to point out that we did record this and um, in the next couple of days, we'll edit it and then we will put it on YouTube. Um, if you want to the link to that, just go ahead and send me an email and uh, somewhere pro probably by the end of the week, we'll have it posted there and I can send you a link to check it out. Roger? Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, there is one river um, down near Portico, California, which I know you know where that is. Mm -hmm. um, the Tule River, when that was dammed in the late 50s, that used to flow all the way down through Porterville into what would have been Tulare Lake. And when they dammed that in Porterville, that just flows until it just dries up. So doesn't rain, what, it just runs out. That's what. Yeah, that's one river that just doesn't go anywhere anymore. Yeah. Okay. All right, Steve. Um, the only last last it wasn't a question, but it was Ian saying that um you did a great job and that your, oh, your mom Thanks and dad you. should be proud. Yeah. Oh, they're still here? Oh man. I think they are. <laughs> yes, they are. I see them. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks Thank for sticking around, everybody. It, it was fun, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Very good. Right. Thank you. Great job, Steve. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for Great the fun job. overview of uh, fish biology, Steve.